<laughs> the overall name for our mission is preaching, proclaiming the word of God, teaching the love of God as proclaimed in Jesus. So the mission is to preach, and if you look at St. Luke chapter 12, verse 49, you have Jesus speaking passionately, saying, I have come to cast fire upon the earth. And he's speaking with a desperate earnestness about his mission. He's come to spread the word. It's something that's like wildfire. If it catches, it should be able to spread all the way round the world. I hook on to that um, little word of our Lord, the vision that a lady in Halloween had, her name was Jane. She was about to bear a child. And she had a rather unnerving dream, which she told to her parish priest. She said, I had a dream last night. But when I had my baby, it wasn't a baby, it was a dog. And it was home with a fiery torch in its mouth. And it went racing round the world. That is a good dream, said the parish priest. What it means is this. Your son will be a preacher, and he will carry that fire that the Lord spoke of, and he will carry it far and wide. Pray for your son now, who has come into the world, and who is to bear the word of God. And Jane was reassured, and when her little boy grew up, and became uh, Dominic, a canon of St. Augustine, and then after that, the founder of a group of preachers. She could see that the vision was a true vision. One of the symbols we have in the Dominican order is of this leaping hound bearing a torch. If you write Dominicans in Latin, it's Dominicanes. If you split that word into two, Domini, Carnes, it means the hounds of the Lord. So the, we are the hunting dogs of the Lord. That we travel far and wide and we take <laughs> So Domini Carnes, that is why the students at Oxford have got a website that they call God's Dogs. G-O-D-Z-D-O-G-Z. And if you look up God's dogs, you'll see what these young hounds are up to and <laughs> how they're preaching the word of God and preparing to preach it more widely. St. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, as this is 1 Corinthians 9, verse 14, spoke of the compulsion to preach that was in him, saying, Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. It's like a fire in his heart that compels him to speak. And so Dominic also, I will add this picture onto that, Paul, Dominic himself used to speak freely to people and listen to people wherever he went. But at night, he would lie down on the ground and he would weep the cry, oh my God, what will become of sinners? For Dominic, the kind of suffering that engaged him and which made him weep so bitterly was, there's so much false teaching, there's so much heresy, rubbish being taught, pernicious rubbish, rubbish that will lead you nowhere at all. There's so much falseness in the world. How can these sinners be shown the truth? And so he thought, I must find people who would lead, who would study, and who would preach. So that's the preaching mission of the order coming from Jesus and through his apostles and into Dominic's own day. Dominic knowing that he couldn't be a static benediction in one house, that he had to be free and wanted a different kind of order where people would be wanderers, 
very pathetic. As soon as he had 12 men, he sent them out, two by two, go across Europe, you go to France, you go to Germany. A mad kind of enterprise. And the men went with the grace of God with them and set up foundations and houses all over Europe in the 1200s. Now, what about women's preaching? When we look again at the New Testament, we, we see in St. John's Gospel, chapter 4, here's the Samaritan woman at the well. Chatting to Jesus, even though the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus' disciples are a bit surprised to see him talking to a Samaritan woman. But she is listening to him. When he tells her some home truths, she doesn't take offence. She just comments, you must be a prophet. Why should I be worshipping? And she talks about the prayer at Jerusalem, the prayer on this holy mountain. And it's to this Samaritan woman that Jesus says the time will come when people will pray in spirit and in truth. She runs to tell the others, here's a woman preaching, there's no doubt about it. Come and hear a man who tells me everything that, that I knew. And they come because the preaching of a Samaritan woman who is, as the phrase goes, no better than she ought to be. So, John, chapter 4, verses 28 and then um, 39, that the men come to hear Jesus and say, we believe now, not because of what you said, but of what he said. This is the chain of our preaching. That the woman mm -hmm. tells them they believe what she says. They come to Jesus and they hear what Jesus says. This is what we hope will always happen where there is good preaching. That people will come to the Lord. And then also in this wonderful Gospel of St. John, there's Mary Magdalene, John chapter 20, meeting Jesus in the garden on the resurrection morning, speaking to him, at first not recognising him, and then listening to his command, go and tell my brethren. This woman is being told to go and preach to the apostles. What's she to preach? The resurrection. There's the most vital and wonderful message, and it was the woman who to go and take it. She's called, therefore, the Apostle of the Apostles, and she is a great patroness of our order. Of course, our first patroness is Our Lady, who's got the lovely title of the first Christian, the one who first believed in the word the angel gave her, and who, as we're told, two or three times, pondered all these things, turned them over, talked to them, would say engaged in meditative prayer. So, Our Lady Mary Magdalene, these are preachers of the word to us. Now, another point I want to speak of is collaborative preaching. And here I am, a great enthusiast. When the movement came for the new evangelization, you should go into into the world again, and we should preach the gospel once more. I don't know what year it was that that started, but I do remember I was at that time living in Norway, and there were two Dominican houses in Oslo, uh, to whom the message came very, very directly. And so uh, the Bishop of Oslo said, anybody who wants to preach in the parishes, would you come, uh, come to a meeting? And uh, we had a meeting there with, with the bishop, and he said, I'm proposing that we have teams of men and women going into parishes who invite them to spend three or four days there and engage with them in um, the, the use of the sacraments and in preaching the use of the Bible and in reviving their own prayer life. And I've had wonderful experiences both with a group of Dominicans, men and women, 
and we engage with that parish. The pattern was to have a very simple meal in the evening to which the whole parish was invited. In one parish it was a baked potato, in another parish it was soup, and in another it was a very hot curry. And people came along and had something to eat and talk while we ate, which is always, as you know, a very good thing to do. But as well, we had sermons from the priests. We had the uh, anointing of the sick each of those three or four days we were with the parish. Uh, confessions were heard every day. And we had beautiful liturgy, which we were well prepared. So when I came to Cambridge, Sister Valerie and I went off with Father uh, John Patrick from the brothers down there to the parish in Sherborne, and we did exactly the same thing. And it had exactly the same, most beautiful and enlightening effect. So preaching together is beautiful. Now there are actions that speak louder than words. And here, men and women are absolutely equal. It's been said once, not as a compliment, what you are speaks so loudly that I cannot hear what you say. Uh, you are a horrible person. That flavour comes right over <laughs> to people. Um, words alone have no power and value. People were amazed at Jesus because of who he was and what he said, and the way these two things came together, the way in which he was, as the Samaritan woman said, like nobody I've ever met before. Well, we should all try to be wonderful people. But I'm thinking... <coughs> About some things that need to be said today, for instance, people having the right to life, that abortion is wrong, planning the death of a child is wrong, planning the death of an old person is also wrong, and the great movement for euthanasia, which is now legal in Belgium, I believe, as well as in some other parts of the world, is again this creeping um, I don't know, approach to death. Now, we can say, I don't approve of abortion, I don't approve of euthanasia, but if you are a woman, as we are members of a woman's congregation, you can show that by running a school for profoundly disabled children, children that people think are not worth keeping. And these children are told, you are special, you have a value, you are, your value is beyond price. We are all created by God who loves us and creates us out of love for him so that we will finally be with him forever. And Dominican sisters also specialize in work for the deaf. And sisters from the side are singing for her. It's celebrating your, you are of value. You can override your, your handicap. And then the euthanasia question of what value is my life when I get old? Is it, am I of worth? Am I of value? And so we run a home for the aged in stone, St. Mary's home, and try to give elderly people a life of, of quality and a life in which they are treated with respect and love. It's a continual struggle to go on doing this with people's disability. You show them what you mean by love and respect for your parents, for the elders, and what the value of life is. So we've been very glad to have the help of sisters coming from India who've been doing voluntary work in the home. Women as preachers, of course, we are just knocking around in the world all the time, aren't we? And you can get a chance of preaching the gospel, standing in the pew at the co-op, or anywhere. 
I work in a very rough place. Um, at Effie College, 16 to 19 year olds, 14,000 of them. They come racing down the corridors. <laughs> One of them roared at me down the corridor. The others have heard this story so many times. <laughs> what are you? Are you a nun? <laughs> yes. You don't have sex, do you? No. What do you do then? <laughs> <laughs> well, we pray. And then suddenly, would you pray for me then? <laughs> so three boys and myself holding hands in the corridor. Saying it. Well, that, was, that was working. One that worked out all right. You, you get in this world sometimes ignored, but sometimes you are able to speak to people. And I've always moved when people ask for prayers, and that's happened to every one of us. And it would happen, it's possibly happened to you too, that people see you coming out of, out of church. There are sufferings with preaching. And there are joys with preaching. One of the preachers that we specially remember, because we have a mother house at Stone, was a man, not a Dominican, but a passionate, who preached from that little chapel, which is enclosed now in our grounds, St. Anne's Chapel, and who preached in the potteries in very broken English. And People went to laugh at him, and then they stayed to listen to him. And he had a most tremendous effect in the country. And Cardinal Newman met him later on. Newman, who said, when I meet a holy priest in the Catholic Church, I believe in it. And he asked this Dominic Barber to receive him into his church. Preaching, preaching, we're all called to preach. This is the commission given to every Catholic Christian, every Christian indeed, end of St. Matthew's Gospel, go into all the world, that we have to preach and baptize. So that's the mission. Individual talents are always coming up and can be used in unexpected ways as part of this mission. We had an um, entrance who came from the Royal Ballet. What can a ballet dancer do as a preacher? She was sent out to Norway and she looked around her and she found here was a town, a small town, up in the Arctic, with quite a burgeoning population, but no school of dance. So she set up the school of dance at once. We have lovely photographs of Sister Ruth. She's wearing her full habit, but black ballerina shoes. And there she is, with a whole string of, of youngsters behind her, doing the pirouette. Uh, within six months, she had 250 members in the dance school, and they were doing shows three times a year. And now there are, I think, four schools of dance in the town, and nearly every one of them is led by one of Sister Ruth's former pupils. So when they came, of course, they came to dance, but they also came to meet the sisters. and. You know, things grow, and the word is heard, and you have a choice of subjects for your, your ballets and your pieces of theatre, and so the word of God is true that way. In today's world, both men and women have access to the internet, and the word can spread like a wildfire. I think our Lord might be echoing what he said before, because it does spread like wildfire when you have books. So although, as Paul says, women are not of the official priesthood, 
and are therefore not invited to stand in the pulpit and preach after the gospel. There are so many ways in which we must share. It's laid upon us as Christians. We must share in the preaching of the word. And we do. And that's the mission of the Dominicans. Whatever else we may be doing, 